And what's up guys, hope you're having the best day of your life today. Today we got some awesome stuff. We are gonna talk about momentum and impulse, all right? As well as go through a couple of different examples of how you use impulse and momentum formulas so you'll be set, you'll be good to go. First things first, just a little bit of background, guys. We remember that Newton's second law, Newton's second. It says F net equals MA. And to be honest, this is not how it was originally written. Just like Newton's first law and Newton's third law, Newton's second law was originally written in words. And what he said is he said the change in motion is proportional to the force that's applied to an object, all right? So essentially what he said is if I change motion, I can do so only by adding a force to an object. And he called motion a mass times its velocity. So the mass, so the product of the mass and the velocity, he called motion, which is momentum which created the momentum formula. Now the symbol for momentum is a lowercase rho, but we just call it a P, all right? And it has a unit, which we can see from this product of a kilogram times a meter per second. There is no derived unit. So when we see the formula for momentum, we see P equals m. V. Now this is a basic linear momentum problem, but what we're really, really interested in is we are interested in this change in momentum. We are interested in a change in P, because that's really what Newton was interested in, so so are we. And he said that we have a change in P which is proportional to a force that we put on an object. But we also know that if I look at delta P, to do so, I can change an object's velocity. That's how I will change this. So we say that we have a change in momentum is equal to M because we don't really change the mass of an object, but it's very easy to change an object's speed. Right? So when we say we have F, the force on an object is proportional to the mass times a change in speed. But there was one piece that was missing from what Newton was talking about. And that was the fact that I can change an object's speed, okay, over a very, very long time with a small force, or I can change an object's speed very, very quickly with a very big force. So there was this extra piece right here, and we said divided by delta t. How fast do I apply that force? And then we see that's really how Newton's second law came into play. That's where F equals ma was born because of this delta v over t. But it started with a change in motion or a change in momentum. So if we look at an example of this, let's say that a golf club, that's a, good, that's a pretty good golf club, right? A golf club hits a golf ball with a mass equal to 0 0.505 kilograms. 05. And the time of impact, so how long the golf club is touching the ball, is going to be one millisecond. If the ball has a final velocity, or it gets a velocity of 70 meters per second, what is the average force that was applied to the ball. So we can say that F now is equal to delta P, change of momentum, over delta T, which is going to be M delta V over T. The initial velocity is zero, right? So we look at this mass, 0 0.05. On the top, we had a change in speed of 70 meters per second divided by one times 10 to the minus third, that's a millisecond, and that is gonna equal an average force of 3,500 newtons. 
Okay, but as time went on, this expression for delta P took on its own fancy name. So delta P now, we have a fancy name for this and we call this impulse. Impulse is a fancy name for delta P and it is going to have a symbol of capital J. Not to be confused with joules. This is a variable, joules is a unit. All right, so we say J equals delta P. Now, if, if we look at this other formula now, delta P equals F change in T, right, from that formula that we just wrote, F equals a change in momentum proportional to its time, all right? We can also see now that if delta P equals F change in T, that means that impulse J is also equal to delta P, which is now going to be equal to F change in T. Now, on some reference tables, you might see this formula written. On the AP reference table, you are given P equals MV, and you are given delta P equals FT. Okay, you are not given this impulse. So this word impulse is just something that is used and something that you need to be aware of. Okay, so let's look at a couple different applications for J here. If I have a football player and here's a foot, different than a golf club, and it kicks a football. Yeah, I was a soccer player, sorry guys. It, it kicks this football with an M equal to 0.4 kilograms and it gives it a launch speed equal to 30 meters per second, find the J and the average force if the impact time or the time of interaction is equal to eight milliseconds. All right, so this is gonna be the first question that we wanna solve. So we say that J equals delta P, all right? Now that delta P is gonna be equal to M V final minus V initial, and there was no initial velocity, this was equal to zero initially, so that we can say the impulse J was just equal to M final, M V final, all right? So we have 0.4 times 30 meters per second, it has an impulse of 12 kilogram meters per second. So that is the first part of the answer right here. Now the second part now wants us to say the average force is equal to the impulse over delta T. Now where did I get this from? Remember, F equals delta P over T, and delta P is synonymous with J. So I could say F equals J over delta T. Now we have 12 kilogram meters per second, which we just solved for. And then we have eight times 10 to the minus third, which is milli. And we see that the force exerted on this object is 1,500 newtons. Now, I know this video is getting a little long, guys. I want to do one more example of one that's a little bit more tricky. So stay with me right here. This last question here, we're going to have a stunt man. He's skinny. Skinny stunt man. We'll say that his mass is equal to 80 kilograms. And he is going to jump out of a window. This was a window that he just jumped out of. It's a pretty good window. Though. Yeah. Okay, that's a window. And that window is located at a distance or a displacement delta y that is equal to 45 meters above the ground. I want to know A, how fast is he going when he hits the ground? I want to know B, if he lands in a safety net and the safety net slows him to a stop in, in 1.5 seconds, the net slows him What's the force applied to him as he comes to rest? All right, so essentially, what is the force that the net applies to this person as it slows 
him over this time. And then part C, if he landed on the concrete instead, the ground slows him in 10 milliseconds, what's that force? So I want to see the difference in force as if a net slows him down in 1.5 seconds as opposed to slowing him down in 10 milliseconds. That's not 10 meters per second, that's 10 milliseconds. So let's just whoop, see you later. All right, so that's 10 milliseconds. So let's first start with part A. Part A, guys, is a conservation of energy, which we just learned about. So he's gonna have some gravitational potential energy, which is gonna get created into kinetic energy. And there will be a total conversion if there's no re uh, resistance of friction. And he'll fall, 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 and right here, just before he hits the ground, he'll have maximum Ke. So we'll have mg delta y, which is the formula for that, which equals one half mv squared. This is beautiful, I can get rid of the m's. And I find out his speed upon impact is gonna be two g y, the square root of that, because of this v squared. So we have the square root of two, I'm gonna use 10 meters per second squared because it's the AP level. You might be using 9.8, that's up to you. 45 meters, and we see that the speed when he hits the ground, just before he hits the ground is 30 meters per second. Okay, so that's just a re review of the conservation of energy when there's no outside non-conservative work being done by friction. In the next part, we can say because of impulse, we have F change in P, divided by t, so we have some sort of momentum final minus momentum initial over t, and there's no final momentum because he stops, right? So he comes to rest, so p final is zero. Initially, he had mv, and this is just before he hits the net, not out of the window, and that's gonna be delta t, all right? So this final is when he stopped, this initial is right here, just before he hits the net. So we have 80 kilograms times 30 meters per second, which we just solved for. Now remember, this minus, that applies still, so I'm gonna throw this minus in here, divided by 1.5 seconds to slow them down. We see the force applied is 1,600 newtons, and yes, that would be a negative force because of this negative, but in this example, I'm only asking for the magnitude of the force, so the direction doesn't matter. So we could say the force applied is 1,600 newtons, which is a lot of force, but it won't kill you. The last one, though, it might. If we change the time from 1.5 seconds down to 10 milliseconds, we see a major difference. If we do the same thing, delta P over T, Everything's gonna be the same with the exception of time. So we have this, now we have this 80 kilogram, 30 meters per second, but now we need to stop this person in 10 times 10 to the minus three seconds. So now we see a force of 240,000 newtons. All right, so this is a good example of it's not the fall that kills you, it's the sudden stop at the bottom. And guys, a little fun fact, this is the reason that we have an airbag in our car. What an airbag does is increase the time. So if I have F equals delta P over T, what your airbag does is say, hey, let's take the speed that your face is driving at Let's increase the time to change its momentum, which is gonna lower the force on your face. I've seen that, you know, that airbag question before, and that's something that you definitely need to think about, right? As opposed to the windshield or the steering wheel, which stops your face in a small, very little amount of time and increases the force that is applied to your face. Because you're stuck around this long, I'm gonna give you a, one last little tip, a little hint. Guys, you can also find impulse using a graph. And I've seen questions before where they ask about like a certain object. So let's say this is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, and this is five, 10, 15, 20. And this is a, uh, this axis is force and this is time. So if I had a graph 
And guys, these are all straight lines. I'm, I'm going kind of quick. A little fun fact, you can find impulse with the area under a F versus T graph. So if you wanted to know the impulse over this 10 second period, you would break this into its different segments and you'd find this area, one half MV squared. Then you would take this and this would be a squared, you'd find this area. And then you would take this area here and you would take the sums of all of those areas. So for example, if I said that in this example, the mass was equal to 0 0.07 kilograms and it was initially at rest, during the, ten, during the t equals 10 milliseconds, what was the J? I would just find the area under each one of these segments and I would get my J equal to two meters per second. So that would be an easier way. So you almost get excited when you see a graph, similar to when you have, and this is a little bit of review, similar to when you have a V versus T graph, the area under a V versus T graph is D. The same is here. The area under an F versus T graph is equal to J. I know that was a long one, guys. I hope it helped. If it did, please give the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, let them know that I'm making videos to help you guys out. All right, and um, I'll see you on the next one with the law of conservation of momentum.